All right, guys, we are live. It's episode 255 of the Shooter's Mindset Show. Thank you guys for tuning in today. I'm your host, Anthony. Joining me, co-host Jennifer Seymour. What's going on, Jen? Hey, everybody. Mr. Cannon's in the house. What's going on, Cannon? Hey, everyone. And the uh, guest and star of the hour, he's the uh, what owner of Sniper Tide. He does the Everyday Sniper podcast, which is very popular. He's also a professional NASCAR driver. We have Frank Galley. What's going on, Frank? How you guys doing? Great to be on. <laughs> yeah, I, thought someone, I, saw, I saw the jersey with the with the logos on it so I yeah it. exactly i told i told that story believe it or not and i told, I, told, I don't know if i've ever told this on the show but we were having dinner at a, a some bar after a match and we just went in our jerseys i mean at the time i was stickered up man i had i didn't have a an ounce of room on this jersey right and what lady sitting across the bar and we would just I, I told her i was a professional nascar driver me and my buddy we were down here we were from miami we were professional nascar driver she bought it all right she I, well at least i think she did right and we're just rolling with it acting like we know what we're talking about and we were nascar driver it was awesome though. You, you know there's pro nascar guys who shoot <laughs> competitions and stuff uh like i when i went to guardian in tennessee i had dinner with the uh the team guys from uh ty dylan's car uh, the Geico car uh, on they had the off weekend and so they came and shot competition on their off weekend but like the guys who do best targets and stuff are all NASCAR crew chiefs and in, in the Monster Cup series there so right they're there they're out there there, there it is perfect we're gonna get into the shooter's mind there's plenty more where this story comes from yeah, but yeah. we'll leave it we'll leave it at that <laughs> uh the folks over uh show sponsors right the folks over at tactical shit shop that tactical shit.com for all your tactical shit needs gear shooting a apparel the whole deal we'll have a discount code coming from them later on in the show also the folks over at dsl technologies if you're looking for a suppressor you're in the market for one of those you got a prs gun you got some pistols you got some ar-15s they got the suppressor you need check out dsltechnologies.com all right if you're watching on the youtube side of things you want to get your question in live top right hand corner you can join the conversation jennifer's over there scanning those i'll probably be in there just talking messing around and Cannon's over there on the Facebook, the Shooter's Mindset Facebook page. It's a pinned post or a most recent post. If you prefer to use Facebook, you can comment in the comment section of that post and give Cannon some action over there on the Facebook uh, mm -hmm. side of things. Get to All work. right. Also, uh, the Shooter's Mindset website, shootersmindset.com, where you can watch the show live. You can shop around, get some training. Um, and what else? Our blogs are over there, over all at shootersmindset.com. All right. Uh, let's kick this one off, uh, Frank. For those who are unfamiliar with you, tell us a little bit more about yourself and kind of how you got involved in the shooting industry. Uh, it goes back because uh, I, I enlisted in the Marine Corps as soon as I was 17, uh, right out of high school. And uh, first thing I did is, is went to scout sniper school. I was a PFC. So the Marine Corps, the scout sniper, deploying as the same um, in different things and just, you know, however you want to look at it. When you go back to the 80s, uh, there was some combat action that was involved with the Marine Corps at the time with Iran. So I went and played in that pond a little bit. And then when I came out, we'll let it go for a while. And in 2000, I started the Sniper Side website. And right at the beginning of the Internet kind of stuff going on. And that's where that got pretty popular pretty fast. From there, got recruited down to Rifles Only. Uh, Jacob had come up uh, from Rifles Only, had come up to Connecticut and said, hey, you need to have a competition uh, as part of Sniper's Hide, you need to come down and see us. And, and I did and actually started working there from about 2003 to about 2011. And right around, you know, halfway through that became full time in the gun industry, teaching, doing the website and got out of my regular job and just started doing this job. So ever since then, it's just been, you know, nonstop you know, long range shooting teaching around the country, around the world, different places, and, you know, just going through the social media and website stuff, and then the podcast came and all that other, so it's just blown up from there. So, yeah, I mean, two, and you, you were at this, you know, maybe 2000, a little bit before that, so you've seen this kind of game kind of really change or, or a lot more popular. It's grown in popularity. Yeah, it's Obviously, evolved. It's, it's, it's yeah. definitely, I mean, we were, it, back in the day, it used to be there was only like four matches a year. And, and these were something that, you know, as long range matches go, they were two day events. They were bigger. They usually had some kind of train up component or something. So guys would spend either a full week doing this and then do the two day event or 
if they came for the two day event, it was a four day event because your days before your days after. And, and it just grew from there. I mean, all the, you know, the old school guys that everybody talks about in the, in the precision rifle from the gardeners to the Terry crosses to Wade Stoopville's and, and all those guys, we were all just moving around to these four matches. You would do a rifles only, you would do attack pro then Allegheny sniper challenge and then maybe one other like a Badlands or a Storm Mountain. There was one or two mixed in. But then, and we started doing multiple events a year out of rifles only. And it just got crazy because our events would sell out in minutes. You know, we'd say, hey, registration opens at 10 tomorrow morning. By 10.01, it was full. And so that's, we just saw it just evolve from there, you know, from an, out of that South Texas and working down there. Oh, there we go. I mean, you have the, there's a new uh, sniper side bolt gun with that Asbury uh, precision ordinance, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, tell we, us about the inspiration behind that and how's it playing out and when can we get one? Yeah, well, you start ordering them now. They just came out this week to, to order them. But how it came out is I teach classes mostly. I, you know, I do matches in between a lot of the local comps. I just did a match down on rifles only last weekend. But I don't do as much because I, I teach. That's my thing is I'm an instructor. I've been working down, like I said, from the rifles only years when I left there, started working among the classes on my own. And the problem we saw was everybody asked gear questions. It's all about gear. Okay. So you go to a class mm -hmm. and, and the first and last question is, what do I buy? Well, we were, you know, I did some work with Ruger and they, they prototyped the Ruger RPR out here at my range and, and some stuff for years with them. We, you know, say Tika's and Hey, go grab a Tika. But it was how to get somebody into long range precision rifle without spending the money. And, you know, cause you could spend a ton of money. You get an AI 70, you know, seven grand, you know, unless you get an AT at four grand and, and all the custom stuff that people are doing now are average around $5,000 before you put a scope on it. So we want to bring new people in. And, and the recommendation was always get the Ruger RPR. You know, we, we knew that platform. Problem was, we take them apart. We pull the stock off of it, and we put a Magpul stock on. We pull the handguard off. We put a Seekins on it. You're upgrading the bolt to the to the plastic piece off, and we're throwing that away. You know, so we're taking a thousand dollar rifle, and we're putting fifteen hundred dollars worth of work into it. Before we tell somebody, now you got a good rifle. Tika's same thing. You get an eight hundred dollar Tika, and you go out and buy a chassis for it, and put it together. Change the bolt knob, maybe change the shroud, a couple things. Then you got to change the barrel because the barrels are slow. Their 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 muzzle velocity is way down. So we found all these entry level rifles were doing too much work. So with Ashbury, we we got together with them, and I've known Morris and those guys for years. They have a Marine Corps component to it. They hire all twenty one twelve uh, gunsmiths over there in armorers. So they said, we can build you a rifle on our chassis for 1900 bucks and it'll be turnkey. All you gotta do is put a scope on it. So I spec'd it out. I said, okay, we're gonna take that Remington barreled action. They're, they're taking it apart. They ear gauge it, they clean it up. They don't do a full blueprinting, although they will. You can, you can actually order accuracy upgrades to it, but they take a Remington barreled action and they QC it and pull it apart, put it back together. Then they replaced the trigger with a trigger tech. So we're using trigger tech triggers in them. Then they put it in their chassis. And their chassis is foldable, upgradable, it's modular. You can change out the front, the back, whatever you want. Once it's in that center section, you're good. So we were able to create this turnkey rifle. And I, it, it, can you shoot comps with it? Absolutely. but. I look at it as a training rifle. You get it in 308, 65 Creed, 223, or you can upgrade it to any of the 65 caliber, 260, 6547. You can get it in a Valkyrie. So they'll work on it, but we wanted that relationship with a builder where you can order it from one place, you can order it however you want, pick your colors, and do, you know, and be done. Because I think a lot of people get pushed into spending too much money before they know whether they like it or not. And the right. ones that they're not spending the money on actually need some work to really kind of get you to the next level with them where, you know, you're not, you know, people think that the, like the Ruger is clunky 
it, you know, it's noisy. It's kind of, it makes, it, it's just not where somebody looks at and goes, oh, I got a great rifle. They know it's a stepping stone. Right. They know they're going to move out of it. Where this is something we can kind of, you know, it's, it's built on a Remington action. You could do anything you want to it. it. All the aftermarket parts, we can fix the barrels and do whatever you want. Instead of that factory Remington, you can go to a, a rematch from Criterion. You can go to a full-blown custom. And we can kind of bring you into these little pockets of a great kind of turnkey custom rifle that's 1950 out the door. And that was our goal is to have something I can recommend to people that I know is going to get stood behind. And you don't have to go through other people's customer service and send them back and do all this stuff. It gets checked before you get it. They shoot it. They test target it. They ear gauge it. They clean it. They put it together. They make sure it's right before you get it in a cheap rifle. So it's not batch tested. Yeah, as, as somebody, you know, Jen was talking before the show about how she's brand new to the sport, but I'm even more brand new to the sport because about a year after she got into it, she found out she was technically shooting pro at the gap grind. And somebody <laughs> got. she said, hey, you want to learn more about long range shooting? You had fun that one time you shot my gun. I was like, yeah, I thought she was going to say something like, you know, hey, we'll go out to Fort Gordon. Fort Gordon's like 10 miles from my house um, and, and shoot again. <laughs> No, I, this Friday, sign up for Gap Grind. You want to do it? <laughs> nice. So I totally yeah. suckered him. I didn't want somebody that was expecting a like a pro. A I real wanted, pro. Like, <laughs> a friend that wouldn't kill me. But I'm good at translating knowledge I've gotten. I'm just not good at doing it. So I actually helped him, and he did pretty good. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I twisted did, his arm. Yeah, she, she was a really good pro. She's a, she's a good teacher. Um, but... <laughs> You know, so I, I was think like, that, that's I need, all need, that that all that matters of for a pro shooter, right? Really, yeah. I mean, I mean, it would be great, like if her gun shot in straight lines for that match, um, so <laughs> it could place a little bit higher. But had I not but, burned my barrel out, that would have been a really good match. Yeah, we learned. <laughs> we know, learned the about grind that. is so big and such. It's a learning. See, people confuse competition for learning in that part where it's like you don't go to certain matches to compete; you go to learn. And mm -hmm. when you're at a certain point in your career and your journey however you want to look at it well you you should really go to your first three matches and look at it as training classes mm -hmm. then worry about where you place what you're doing and what's going on you could see what works what doesn't where to spend your money mm -hmm. versus you know because the answer most people get especially like on the pro side today is you know you need a 26 pound six millimeter with this stock with this weight system with this scope and when you're all done, you're eight to ten grand into it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That that's you know, what happens if you don't like it or you find out you don't have the time because of family commitments mm -hmm. or you're just not that competitive. Mm -hmm. Where I showed up to my first match with a borrowed AR ten, dope written on a card that Joe Cayley helped me get, and a rear bag and a bipod. That yeah, was it. That's where but that's how and you I really showed up not though. knowing what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good way of doing it in a way. I mean, granted, you want to, you want, you didn't have a, um, you didn't have like a, a, a circle of friends that you worked with. You needed like that, that team to go with you to mm -hmm. help. Cause it, it does work better. You got to remember when we were up and coming with all this stuff, we worked in groups together and we all, you know, rose everybody up. It wasn't competitive. You wanted to see somebody you knew do well, but it really didn't matter because, I mean, Terry Cross at the time was smoking everybody, but Terry, you're always learning something from him. He's not competitive, even though he's beating you, like you know, like it's going out of style. And and that's that's the key for a guy like you. Go there and learn. Don't go there to compete. Yeah, I, I learned so much in that first match, um, you know, because – Jen taught me a good bit beforehand, but then we had all sorts of awesome shooters on our squad and, you know, everybody's in there helping out. Um, we did a good job of getting squatted up with people that were, that were good teachers. Um, so I had everybody kind of give an input, but um, yeah, I, I kind of wish that, you know, you had your gun when I was getting into it because what I did, my gun turned out fairly similar to that. And, you know, I love the fact that it's a 700. So if you decide you want to change the action, change the barrel, whatever, you know, you could use parts of that gun, forever um but i went i bought a bone stock remington 700 with a threaded barrel because it was on sale at uh academy 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and got a chassis and got a scope and threw a trigger tech in it. And I ended up spending a whole lot more than that rifle. Well, and, yeah. and you will. I mean, that's just the nature of the game. It's gear driven. You know, it's becoming something where you need that much equipment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So La last thing on this on the sniper hide bolt gun, what are the lead, lead times and where can we get one? Um, Ashbury directly. So uh, actually you can go to snipers hyphen sniper hyphen hide hyphen rifle snipers hide rifle with hyphens between dot com and that'll take you right to the website at it's buying direct from ashbury so ashbury precision ordinance the snipers hide edition rifle uh, the lead times are looking depending on where because they had over 200 people send emails and inquire so we're looking at about a four to six uh week lead time for them to be done but everything's been done ahead of time as far as engraving the chassis because they put my logo on it, my name on the handguard and all that other stuff. So um, you go straight to snipers-hotrifle.com and you can buy it direct from there. And that's why we kept the price down at $19.50 for, uh, you know, Cerakoted chassis, the black oxide barreled action, trigger tech trigger in 6.5 Creedmoor, threaded. Ready to go. You got a base on it, and it, it's done. All you got to just put your scope. 1995 or 1950, and Ashbury Precision Direct. So um, there we go. Any any it. live any live that came in or we we're, we're we good do with have that. one live. My friend that's um, side messaging. He wants to know who Frank. Who do you look up to in the sport? Oh, I look up to a lot of guys. I mean, going back to the old school guys, I could tell you all them that I look up to are new. Like, I look up to Phil, you know, Phil uh, Vallejo. That guy's got it going right. I mean, I know all the girls like him because he's easy on the eyes. I mean, I might sleep with him too, but I don't know where <laughs> he'd go. That's who asked is why I'm laughing. A girl? <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, but there's, really there's, I mean, there's guys in this. You look at the gardeners. I mean, gardeners salt the earth. You, you, uh, there's the things with Jacob. Jacob rubs people certain ways. You either love them or hate them. But, I mean, he he, he did so much in this sport. A Terry Cross you look up to. I mean, nowadays, like Kalen, Phil, those guys are definitely people that that I keep an eye on. So there, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, up-and-coming guys that we're taking a look at. And, you know, beyond going to the old school guys that I still look up to. I mean, I even remember, you know, looking at like a Wade Stuteville just to watch him shoot is one of those treats. To see a Terry Cross shoot is a treat. I learned my first match ever um, outside of the Northeast that was typical of what today is, was Terry Cross shot it and I think he won it. And I was squatted with him and just watching him shoot was night and day compared to how I had learned to shoot in the Marine Corps. And, you know, he was much more efficient. He was much more fluid. And he's just super easy to learn from. So there's, you know, there's guys running around there that are definitely, you know, somebody I look up to and pay a lot of attention to what they're doing. Well, Greg, yeah. you got one over there, right? Uh, I don't have any live. I got the, so the next question up, um, you know, we already kind of touched on gear a little bit. Gear is always a big topic in precision rifle shooting. Um, what's your preferred brand of high heels to use while shooting a match? Um, um, I like, um, it's, what is it? Campbell. Campbell are the best cause he's got really high heels, but at, if it's a night shoot, I'm doing the Christian Labutines or whatever they're called. They're the red, hey. so, red soles. I don't, no, Jeffrey he, Campbell is probably my favorite with the spikes and the really high heel. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad he mentioned those shoes because I can never pronounce that type of shit. Yeah, I have no idea what you just said, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah. Louboutin or something, I think they're called yeah. Louboutin. It, uh, Christian, but he, that's night shoots. During the day, Jeffrey Campbell. <laughs> do any of those have like, little LED lights inside of them or anything? Like you uh, see Jeffrey Campbell's are cool, dude. They're spiked and heavy metal. They got these really crazy heels, and they're tall, so it gives me like an extra foot and a half. No. And they're in boots. They're boots too. So Cannon, Jeff, oh, oh, the, the the big like lace up ones. They're all kinds, dude. He's Cannon, got you yeah. totally should have found that picture of him shooting in that. And and, and, and you, you know, I've, I've actually caught flack for the high heels, and I'd like to clear the air. Maxine Nix, if you're listening, it was all her. She said, "Hey, what shenanigans are we gonna do this year?" And I'm said, "Well, Maxine, <laughs> you tell me. What do we What do we want to do?" And she goes, well, the girls in the Southeast are wearing heels on the barricade stage. I said, done deal. Get me heels. 
And unfortunately, she couldn't get stripper heels because they didn't have them in my size. I'm a little small. Mm -hmm. um, so she brought me the heels. And then the funny thing is there was no barricade stage in that event. So I wore them anyway. So I said, to, she goes, oh, you don't have to wear the heels. There's no barricade stage. I said, did you bring them? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, give them to me. I'll wear them. And I wore them until a fire ant got underneath the toe. <laughs> I had open toe, oh, shit. and he yeah. bit me right on the top of the toe. So I took him off after I got bit by a fire ant. <laughs> um, someone wants to know about the wig and green speedos. Yeah, that was another Maxine Nix. So there was a K and M. K and M. <laughs> so there's me wearing a wig and, and a speedo. But did she tell you the part where I got naked in front of her? It's not she, her telling me. It's oh, Ryan it's Hay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. Of, so, of course, Ryan will do so that. So they bet me that I, at the end of the match, I wouldn't wear a wig and a Speedo. So I said, <laughs> well, why wouldn't I? <laughs> and when, when the match was over, she's like, hey, I got your Speedo. So the first thing I did was pull my clothes off and stood like three feet in front of her with no clothes on and said, okay, I'll put them on. <laughs> <laughs> I love me yeah. some Maxine. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. And Maxine's great. She shoots a lot of comps down there with her husband, Billy. Sorry, mm -hmm. Billy. Her and I have a you know good time. And 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 so we, we, we have fun. I mean, that's kind of a whole thing, but it's a goof because I actually caught flack that I was um minimizing the event by wearing heels. So somebody actually complained. Oh my oh, gosh. Oh, Look, I do this because it's fun. Exactly. Like when I went to court, well, Altus, whatever we're calling it today, um, like two weeks ago now, a week and a half ago, I had the most fun. We got an Airbnb and like nine of us stayed in the house. It was like yeah. Ryan, Ryan Hay and Gina and um, uh, Jacqueline and her husband and a couple other people. Anyway, we had the best time. The whole weekend was just fun. Well, that's what it's supposed to like, be about. I mean, right. this is a hobby. Nobody, nobody's shooting this. I don't know about three gun. You guys may have agents, but as far yeah. as I know, <laughs> nobody has a sport agent. And until you get nobody a is making money on shooting. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, they look at me cause it's my job and the website and all this other, like other stuff. And they'll, they'll kind of get this jealousy kind of deal going on. It's like, dude, you're not going to show up. And just because you top 10 to match are going to start bringing in money. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of drives this weird because they're trying to, you know, figure out, is this a sport or a hobby? It's like, well, it's a hobby today. Nobody's got an agent. There's no single series that covers the country. There's no NFL. You know, we're, 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 uh, Jackie there. What was that? Um, the tropics, man. We're the Flint tropics. No. So, um, it, it's just not, it's, it's not happening. And, and I hate to break it to people that you're not going to, you're going to lose money shooting an event. You're not going to make money. Yeah. All right. I, feel like, I feel like it's a lot like dirt track racing or hunting. The easiest way to become a millionaire to, uh, or to make a million dollars doing it is to start with two. Yeah, exactly. You know exactly. I mean? Like, look, you know, I'm, I, me and Anthony were talking before anyone else got on. It's, I'm, I love shooting. I, I'm shooting three matches this week um, of various different disciplines. Um, I'm never a top finisher, but I have the, the freaking time of my life going out there and shooting against the clock, shooting against other people. I'm, I'm never first. Who but cares? It's just, yeah. I'm not, your life is not defined by where you place in an event. No. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a when I die, of, nobody's going to say, you know, Frank came in what place in 19 or 2002, Frank scored this. Uh, it's not going to be on my stone, man. No, okay. People remember the shit like yeah. you showed up in heels. Yes, or, they'll remember I wore heels yeah. before they remember yeah. where I placed. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It was fun. I mean, I know Frank, you probably got, you know, some of this too. I mean, it's like they, they hear you on the podcast. They see you kind of like this veteran guy and, People like I want to go out and I want to beat Frank. I, I had these guys that that they wanted to beat me because I guess I was on you know the shooter's mindset and whatever. I I show a flashy gun and uh, they wish they had or something on the gram or something. And I show up to the match and you know we shake hands, we talk, and they're like, dude, yeah, I just I just I'm shooting, I'm coming out here. I, I really want to beat you. I'm like, really, you want to beat me? Yeah. Out of all people, you want to beat me, dude? I mean, you need to. I don't know. That's the wrong <laughs> you know, priority. Game. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, the first time that actually happened to me, I was like you. I, I was like, dude, what did I do to you? 
you know, yeah, like, I mean, because it, I did have somebody come up to me in, in, you know, back years ago and say, I just, and it's, a, it's amazing. Cause you can, you could tell when they're over your shoulder, like watching you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to me, it's so frigging annoying. I want to just do like, um, I actually have a video because Phil Vallejo's camera was still on when I shot my run at Rifles Only last week. So on the on the culverts, you can see me running my run after and Phil sent me the video. I'm talking with Jay Ruby the entire time I'm shooting. I'm like swearing and I'm like shooting and I'm like, Jay, why didn't you call a hit? He's like, you missed. I'm like, F you, Jay, you piece of crap. We're talking and, and I'm talking the entire time time i was i matter of fact i talk more than i shot and and it's just who cares I, you know i was done on the first day at rifles only at 145 and i was in the barn talking with jacob before and like the next person finished close to three o'clock i was done for an hour and a half in socializing i didn't care mm -hmm. i mean it doesn't matter it, it's 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 a game it's mm -hmm. like you know, I went home over Christmas and I played Monopoly. It's like, okay, who cares? I played a game of Monopoly. There's no difference than me playing Monopoly in Connecticut and me shooting a match in Texas. It's identical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have two goals in this sport, and that is to improve. Like, uh, after Altus, everybody's like, oh, where'd you play? So I'm like, oh, like, I don't even remember. I know what my percentage of the winner was because I, that's what I look at is what, like, to me, I feel like that number should be increasing as I am growing sure. in the sport and learning. I want my percentage of the winner to increase. I'm competitive against myself, if that makes sense, and not against anybody else because I'm only trying to beat myself. I'm trying to beat what I did last time. And then my other goal is to have a damn good time while I'm there. And that's yeah. all I care about. I want to have yeah. fun and make friends and I want to improve on myself. I don't care if I beat this person or that person. Would I like one day to be high lady? Yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, I'd more like to beat everybody because I don't care about male, female. I right. want to beat her. You know, I, I, that doesn't, I'd rather beat everybody, but it's not like my ultimate goal. If it happens one day, great. If I stay where I'm at, I'd like to just every time improve a little bit on this maybe not time out as much or maybe you know not miss as much or not have trouble with this one particular thing as much and that's right. just my goal that and have fun and i have a blast when i go to yeah. matches and that's the way to do it it doesn't matter that's you're exactly right in that mindset to go there and into into test yourself and then use the, the booklet they give you for notes to take home to study to practice what you did bad on you know yeah. and, and there's a lot of benefits to doing that and it'll make you a better more well-rounded shooter but you have to treat it as something and not go into the hyper competitive mode right off the gate now don't get me wrong there's some really good natural hyper competitive shooters out there guys who are just instinctively you know at the top of their game quickly but that's not everybody that's 10 percent what about the 90 percent that shows up you got to folk the 90 percent are paying the bill the top yeah. the, if, if we had a match if all of us said hey we're going to host a match and we said the 10 percent of the best prs shooters in the country aren't coming do you think we would fill our match yeah definitely. of course we would of course yeah. we would because it would be a good course of fire we would all have fun and then they knew well maybe i got a chance so the 10 percent ain't gonna put no asses in the seat nobody's showing up to go and say until they get to that 10 percent, then they want to beat those guys you know if if i'm in the top 10 well then i want to beat everybody in front of me but until you get to that part there's i mean you got family you got life you got you know your job we got all this other stuff to worry about not where I placed on a weekend. This is like golf for us, man. We're, we're taking a day off. And That's what I say. Course. I go to these matches and people are like, so did you win? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, Why would you think that? And they're like, well, you didn't win? I'm like, okay, um, when's the last time you went to the PGA Tour and played around a golf with them and won? Well, I wouldn't win. I'm like, well, there you go. Right. And, and I'm shooting with some of the best shooters in the country. So I'm probably statistically not going to win, but I had a blast doing it. Exactly, yeah. man. <laughs> and, and how much more fun happens outside of the match? In that oh, God. Breakfast. Right. 
that's where all the good stuff that nobody ever hears about is when we go out and somebody does something silly. Somebody puts on a wig and a speedo. They didn't do that during the match. They did it after the match. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's yeah. it's it, man, don't take yourself so serious. And that's where I mean, just to kind of throw this out there while I'm on a rant. Um, it's don't confuse my criticism for me condemning something. Just because I criticize one aspect of it doesn't mean I'm condemning the entire thing. I'm still out there doing it. It's like I never stopped doing it. I mean, you brought up like the jersey letter from three years ago. I put that jersey. That's why I gave you that picture with me wearing a jersey. I put that jersey on after I wrote the jersey letter. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And and it, it's that's that was my goof. And I actually shot it with Mary Beth Olson, the little she was 12 years old, um, the girl. And uh -huh. she has a jersey. She shoots for Prime. I see you got your Prime behind you. She shoots for Jim at Prime. Her and I did pictures with like our, you know, on our jerseys like this. Like, look at our jerseys. Ha, ha, ha. It, it, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're punking everybody and trolling people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, got a, I got a live question. Um, All right. Ryan Hay wants to know um, how much Jennifer loves moonshine at matches. Ooh, Jennifer, talk to us about moonshine. I just messaged you to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I am well, not discussing now, that. There are now, some now, things that should live stay now. in Arizona. To. There are some things that should stay in Arizona, Ryan. That thing crept. It, it sn snuck up on you. He said, <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 He got me uh, in the airport, uh, and I got back to South Carolina. We're just going to leave it at that. Nice. No, no, Frank, nice. So, Frank, what what is your opinion on on uh, on on barricades and shooting props for those who can you know who have trouble reaching? Well, it's kind of it's ridiculous. I mean, it, I here's my bitch. I've complained a lot about it. I designed a two sided barricade with a high side and a low side, and I gave it to them in the beginning, and they said, "No, nah, we're doing this." And why do we? It, number one, it's called a skill stage skill stage but i have to shoot it on my tippy toes and yeah. or wear heels a skill stage is not something that works for greg but not for frank you know jennifer and i need either an apple box set of high heels or whatever to stand and reach because mm -hmm. the, the you know it's at my chin and then when i put my rifle on it the scope goes over my head what skill am i learning how to shoot standing on top of something well of course i can you know i'm gonna climb up but it, it, they should make these things to work it, i don't care if you're 12 years old or if you're 60 years old and you're six five or four five you should be the same on a skill stage and that's my bitch and that's where my criticism comes in does that mean i don't practice it shoot it and condemn it and the other thing i didn't like is when the answer was buy this put a 400 dollars ingenuity gunworks rail on the front of your rifle put the wedges on it block it into the wedges free recoil and stand off to the side get your shoulder out of the stock and just touch it okay yeah. that is not a skill stage that is i spent a lot of money on my rifle i got the weight where i wanted to i put a barrel out front that balanced in the middle and then i wedged it into the barricade and now I'm just tapping an eight ounce trigger like this. And that's supposed to be considered a skill stage. That's my bitch. Why do you think everybody uses the barricade? Like legitimately, I'm not kidding. I had seen the PRS rules book, but I didn't pay that much attention. It was kind of overwhelming. And I went to like four matches and there was a PRS barricade. And then I went to another match and they were like, this is the skill stage. And I was like, well, where's the barricade? Well, this is the prone skill stage. Yeah, there's more than like, one. What? There's more than one? Yes, Every, there is. Uh, all I've ever seen is the barricade. So I went back and looked, and there's like three of three of them, right? Three four, or four. I think there was. Three or four. Yeah. The only one everybody any, ever runs is that barricade. And I don't know if it's just that it's an easier one to do, but like I wonder why we don't use the other three skill stages. The only other one I've seen is the prone one. That's the three different targets. Yep. I've never seen any of the other ones run in a match. Because they they're, they're, they have a wider field of view. You need some of them because you're going from one side to the other. But the barricade, what they said to me was that we already put it in the rule book and people already built it. So we're not changing it. 
Dude, it took like 20 minutes to build one of those. Well, because they don't want them. They want to save them money and all this, you know, and it's like it's the it's the stupid. I'm going to go kneeling, standing, slide over six inches, standing and then back down to kneeling. I'm like, what did I just learn? You know, other than that, like it to me, it should be OK. You want a skill stage that works for everybody? Put a, a, a one minute target at four, six, eight and a thousand and let people shoot it prone on a one minute plate. OK, you know, that's a skill that it translates to everybody that has practical application. Are you a one minute shooter? No. Do something that is, you know, sitting, kneeling, standing prone. Those are our positions. And it should not be where if I do a kneeling on a barricade and I can't reach my bag, you talk about bags, my bag's custom made. It's 18 inches long because I can't reach the kneeling on the kneeling stage. And what I have to do is crank my arm up high and I have a bag that will hopefully bridge the gap so I can actually touch my elbow to something and support it. Otherwise, the kneeling stage, I have to shoot standing. And that's oh. my bitch. Yeah, oh. and that's something, you know, being a taller shooter, um, I'm 6'2". Every once in a while, I, I see it's either, and whether it's in pistol three gun or, or PRS every once in a while I see a stage I'm like oh thank god that, that I'm 6'2 because I shoot the stage totally different than everybody else but yeah. then there's there's the once in the blue moon that I'm like damn I was just a little bit shorter um, we had a, a pistol match a couple weeks ago and somebody somehow we ended up with a port to shoot through that was like below my sternum Yeah. so I had to you know one one guy ran through it, standing up straight through it. I had to stop, bend up, like bend all the way over to get through and, it. And if you cool. balance stuff, the only problem is it's 10 to 1. There's 10 yeah, it, tall stages and one short stage. If you did 5 and 5, I'd have left to complain about. Then you can yeah. say, hey, and, and not a dig on like K&M, but Shannon's really tall. Shannon's like 6'5". <laughs> Everything at K&M is over my head. Yeah, and... and I was about to say, is it Shannon's fault because he's, he's <laughs> well, but it, it, it is, but it's not. It's just yeah. I get it because that's his place and he wants to train and do his thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, most of his stages are tall. And like George corrected this the other day, written in the rules, there's supposed to be something like a, a, a stand to go in front to balance the height. But nobody does that part of it. So there's supposed to be apple boxes, crates and different things that lets you raise the height up for shorter people mm -hmm. but if they made a barricade that had any size they needed which they can mm -hmm. and said pick the one that fits you mm -hmm. then you can go to one for a six two person and i'll go to one for a five two person yeah build, build it out of two by fours instead of a, a piece of plywood it, it, there's a there's a million ways to skin the cat yeah. and all i right. all i'm asking people to do is to think smarter and to think about the audience you know if you want to bring new people into the sport that means kids you know, I have whole squads of kids at my Sniper's Hide matches. There's a, a junior shooter magazine out of Idaho. Those kids all shoot my match. It's an entire squad of nothing but kids under 16. That's if I put it. these, if I put this barricade up and said, shoot it like the skill stage, none of them can reach. Except for the 16-year-olds, the 12-year-olds can't, but the 16-year-olds can. They're taller than me. Yeah, it's like one of my one of my friends I shoot with Sarah. Um, she carries around her tactical stool. Um, yeah. She's maybe five feet. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's all. Little, all it is is it can pack. never be fair for everybody, but you could balance it. I mm -hmm. get it. You're never going to be fair, but try to balance it, man. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Brian Hay says all prone or kneeling. That way, it's universal for everyone, even juniors. Well, and he's right to a degree, but you still want to get people out of their comfort zone. And I'm not opposed to getting people out of their comfort zone. But if you take me out of mine, get Greg out of his. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and that's all. It's like, okay, I'm out of my comfort zone on this stage. Get him out of his comfort zone the next stage. The problem is, is that doesn't always balance that way. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. We're going to get into the discount corner portion of the show. Save, Try to save you money from some great companies who support the show. Jen, you usually start us off. What do you have? Yep, you can get 10% off at carbonarms.us on Carbon Arms. Shotgun shell caddies, extension tubes, ratchet belts, all that good stuff. So check them out at carbonarms.us with TSM10 as the code. You can also get 
ten percent off at the Shooters Mindset Store with Jen TSM ten, and you can get ten percent off of under jerseys if you want to be a jersey boy, like me. Uh, mm -hmm. You get a jacket or shut up you get a jacket or a jersey or whatever i can be whatever i want to identify as in these days right oh god i'm getting high lady next match <laughs> oh shut up <laughs> you gotta wear high heels then deal <laughs> seven feet tall um anyway you can get 10 percent off at under industries on awesome jerseys if you just hit them up on facebook and mention the shooter's mindset well um, greg what do you got I have, you can save 10% off at Overwatch Defense with the code CANON10. Um, shoot, shoot them an email, give them a call. You get an awesome Cerakote job. Um, I'm probably going to be sending my Glock 35 up to them on Monday to see what sort of crazy voodoo magic they could work on it. Mm -hmm. That's all you got? Mm -hmm. um, Frank, anything on the fly here? We didn't really discuss this. No, I'm this good, today. man. I don't have, I'm, you know, no, 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 nothing to plug for me. I'm, I'm there. There we go. There we go. I got I got a couple here. Uh, Shop.tacticalshit.com. TSM10 is a good website wide. Also good in their retail spot in St. Peter's. Uh, Terran Tactical Innovations.com. TSM10 is good for all their parts um, on their website. Uh, UM Tactical for some holsters, some AR parts. You can use TSM10 at umtactical.com. And just that's a quick run through of my discounts here. Um, what do we have here coming up? Uh, Jen, you had one on, you had a question there lined up and announced what you got. Yeah. So talking about gear, I kind of thought about this question because I saw a post in one of the uh, long range groups this week where someone was asking, basically asking beginners what they feel they need at a first match. You know, it's hard. Um, I came from three gun and it was really easy to get friends into it. Cause I'd be like, Hey, come shoot the match. You can shoot my shotgun. You can shoot my rifle. You really just need a pistol. So you have a holster, but you can borrow the rest of my stuff. It's really hard to share long guns in a long range match because it gets hot and it barrel life and all that stuff. So it's kind of harder to convince people to get into it because it's a lot more money to get into PRS. So if somebody is a beginner getting into PRS, what do you feel is the bare bones, what you need to have to go to that first match? Yeah. The, I mean, the entry level rifle, you, you, you are, and, and there's the debate 308, 65 Creed, la la la. I think the 65s are are smarter way to go nowadays for people because they are everywhere. But if you're gonna get an entry level rifle like we talked about the at APO, the the sniper's hide edition rifle, there is something easy. But you need a rear bag, right? You're gonna need some kind of puff pillow for that non-firing elbow, and then a game changer. There's really no way around that. Whether you do a Saracen, a Comanche, a game changer, a game changer pipe. You need one of those bags because universally they definitely work. You know you're going to have a bipod and scope on your rifle already. You need a sling um, to carry. It. And so really it comes down to on a nylon side, you're going to need your sling. You're going to need a, a, a rear bag. You're going to need one sandbag and then the pillow. Um, and so that that gets you in every game everywhere and unfortunately, that's going to run you probably close for just that bit of nylon, 500 bucks. And that's unfortunate that it, it is that expensive, but that's how it works unless you make your own, which you could. And that's what we used to do back in the day, make our own sand socks and bags. But I would not spend any more money than that. If it's something tripody, like a really right stuff tripod, which is expensive, mm -hmm. Wait to see if you like it and want to get it. I mean, I think universally, if you're, you know, military law enforcement and, and going anywhere else, a tripod is the one universal piece of gear where I tell people all the time in classes, if I have to walk from point A where I'm at to point B through the woods, over a mountain, down the other side, I can shoot every situation with a tripod. Doesn't matter. But that doesn't mean you invest in one unless you have an actual need for it. So I wouldn't tell people to buy that right off the bat as one of the first things. But you are going to need the nylon. There's no way around it. So something 6.5-ish um, caliber-wise, you're going to need the good scope and, and that set up uh, the, a bipod and then your nylon and you're ready to go. Yeah. Uh, Tactical Muffin Top says Ruger Precision Rifles, question mark. So I don't know. Yeah, it's they're a good rifle. They just need extra money to put into them to become competitive. Is if you're if you're a guy out there by himself, he wants to go on Saturday, get away from the wife and kids, and shoot for four hours and enjoy himself, and not worry about competing, not worry about the other people are talking. The Ruger's a great buy. 
you could build it up, you could do more to it, or you can keep it bare bones and get them fairly inexpensive. But it is a worthwhile buy. But if you have aspirations to go forward, then it might not be the rifle for you, um, it, at least forward on a competitive side. If you're going to move forward and say, well, I want something bigger, better, and more expensive down the road, but for me, okay, that's cool. You know, the Ruger's still a good buy because the aftermarket barrels. You know, it becomes a semi-custom gun. Oh, there we go, Jen. You had one coming up, or did you hit it already? I think you did hit that one, right? Yeah, I you did. I think I hit that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, Philip Vallejo, said, I was wondering about your thoughts on uh, free recoil. Yeah, yeah, that's that. And I, I just want to explain there's more than one way to skin that cat, and what we were talking about in terms of free recoil was not what <laughs> – they were talking about in terms of free recoil, so we had a disconnect in verbiage. Um, the free recoil I was talking about is no shoulder in the stock, okay? And then they're just using their two fingers to pinch the trigger. What most of us do is we find a balance point in the middle of the rifle, we kiss up to the back of it with not a heavy pressure, an extremely light pressure, then we break the trigger and follow through and use trigger control. But the rifle is coming back and sort of free recoiling. It's not a hard, heavy hold. The free recoil we were bitching about was a straight up not touching the rifle as little as possible. They just put a hand on the scope to hold it from flying off the barricade. And then they just tap the trigger like this and then nothing in the shoulder. It's, it, again, it's training value. What is the training value? If you want to do free recoil, go shoot bench rest. They do free recoil and bench rest. The flat bottom stocks are designed that way. Uh, same thing with F class. F class is very free recoilish with a two thousand dollar front rest, leather baby powder on the bag, and the gun will slide perfectly into that. And they have a stop. You push the gun up to the stop. You fire it. It'll come back free recoil. You push it back forward to the stop, and you have an index point. So, you know that they'll 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 get on me about free recoil, but Phil and Kalen are much more vocal than I am about it, and I just think it's funny. I like to sit back and watch it. <laughs> I, I I said to him, I said you might. That what pissed them off is I said, do you want to be, you, you know, do you want to be a, a you know trigger control or tourist? Do you want to be a, a marksman or do you want to be a tourist? You want to just go there and know you could throw a rifle on top of a bag and not touch it and break the shot. Or do you want to be a marksman and know how to shoot it correctly when you don't have that situation? So that's what pissed them all off because I call them all tourists. <laughs> <laughs> there it, yeah. But I was, I was trolling them. It was Facebook. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> there, we, there we go, Greg. What do you got? Cool. Um, in September, uh, we got to take your class at the expo. Um, a few of us went up there from, from Augusta. Um, we noticed you had a checklist for the fundamentals. What's the most common thing you find in people to get it wrong behind the rifle um, as far as fundamentals go? Uh, trigger control and follow through, number one. I call follow through the forgotten fundamental because most people with a precision rifle don't follow through. They tap the trigger. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they come in, they have a really light trigger, and they just tap it. Body position becomes a situation because a lot of them are off to the side. They grew up with the little green army man. And they didn't realize that guy was crawling and not shooting. So they get off to the side and they can't. It, yeah, if you're a sling shooter and we're going to go shoot Palma, well, then we got to get that 20 degree, 15 degree, 25 degree angle to the side because you need this hand forward to be straight. Where with what we do today, we're straight back behind the rifle. So anybody who's off to the side is a big issue. Um, but trigger control and follow through are the two biggest things. And then from there, it goes to like holding your breath or, or even like bipod height. We see a lot of people who don't understand how a bipod is supposed to work. Uh, big guys have six to nine bipods and have them down all the way. And they're trying to put their head sideways like this to see through the scope because they heard getting lower is better. And they didn't realize that prone is as low as you can get. So why would you get ultra low prone? You know, it, it, you, you adjust the bipod for your body type. If you got a little bit of a, a bare belly, your bipod goes up. If you, you know, if you see Twinkies and you can avoid it, then your <laughs> bipod goes down. You know, and, and so that's the thing is is we see with the checklist. But I think there's 16 points on the checklist, if I remember right, 16 or so different things that I'm looking at when I do the checklist and. 
for my class, that's the first thing I do is I do a safety brief. I get you in, say, here, here, we're going. This is what we're going to do today. Okay, let's go out and shoot now. And then one at a time, you shoot a five-shot group with me standing over you, just picking apart everything I see. There we and go. How does it feel to have him pick apart everything he sees about you? Well, I thought it was funny because everybody was kind of shy when he's like, I need two volunteers. I was like, oh, yeah, I want to know what I'm doing wrong. Like, fix me. Fix me now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, you were about the, the biggest nerd I've ever seen in my entire life during that class. But there, there was so much information. And I think you were at, at the time you were in a better spot to, to learn from it because um, you'd been shooting for a while. And I'm here just like, I've never shot a match before, but like, cool. Yeah. I like yeah. wrote down everything you said. I still have it in a notebook and I still go back and read over it. Well, because I don't, well, it, it, I'm a fundamental guy. I am a marksmanship guy. I don't do the competition classes and the things I can, but I don't. It's not really where I want my focus to be. And there's plenty of people out there that does that. So, you know, mine works no matter who you are and what your discipline is going to be. I mean, we have hunters that go out and, you know, the guy who's never taken a shot past 70 yards. And now he's dropping stuff at 550, you know. And so that to us is where we see the benefit in, in our type of class versus like the competition stuff, which, you know, that that, that has its place. I would say I, I, I learned a, a ton from it. And I'm, I'm that guy that, you know, maybe a year ago, my longest shot was 180 yards. Yeah, you weren't going to do this. You're like, nah. So, and then you went and shot distance and you were addicted just like me. That was the coolest shit ever. You pull the trigger and you just kind of sit there for a minute. And then all of a sudden you just hear a ding. Yeah. I took him out of Fort Gordon and let him shoot my gun. And then all of a sudden it was like, nice. oh, this is fun. Yeah. This is uh, where, can, uh, where can someone uh, take classes with you, Frank? Where can we sign up? And what can we expect from these classes? Sure, I do. Uh, I do classes all over. Um, the only ones available for 2019 are the Mile High classes in Colorado. Here, everything else is pretty much sold out or full. Um, but we've added some classes once a month um, here at my home range. And so, if if you go to Mile High Outdoors, uh, the, the site they, they actually had a crash the other day on something. But oh, uh, Snipers High, there's a training section with a list of dates and times, but I do one class a month and half of them might be open for the mile highs, but like my Alaska classes, I have already 160 students have been signed up since um, November. So they're all full. I have other private classes that I do, like I'm doing a Tennessee class, but that's a private one in full. Um, there's gonna be, I think a Minnesota class, but that's pretty much full. So come to Sniper's Hide, Come in the forum. I'm, I go under low light, L-O-W-L-I-G-H-T, uh, and I own it. And you can hit me up for the different classes. And we have a robust not only training but competition section where you can see dates and times and places to go to classes or go to, um, uh, you know, competitions. But you, you, for my stuff, you got to kind of hit me early. And so I think we're right now booking like August, September, and October and I do March to October for my class schedule. So it's between those months. Sniper's Hide is really a neat thing. Like when I got into this, I didn't know about it. And then somebody said, well, go on Sniper's Hide. And I was like, well, okay. So I went on there. I still don't think I have a hundred posts. So I it, still it's like the Brian Enos. Of yeah, it is. It's we were around back like then. It, Brian Enos and my form were around right around the same times. Oh, yeah, so it's very much like that, but it's for PRS. and. Like there's so much information to be gotten on there. You can either ask a question or like there's a pinned post that I've read probably 14 times that goes through the fundamentals of shooting and like getting a sight picture and parallax and trigger control and wind reading. I, I can't remember what all's in there. There's so all much right. that someone wrote out and it's it's just exactly sitting there. The post you're talking about. That was yeah. about two days of, of work that I didn't get done. Um, sorry, boss, if you're listening. Um, but yeah, I just sat there and read it and, you know, read it and then researched this little part. And it's funny, you Google something precision rifle related and like your first three results are, are uh, threads on the sniper's head. Yeah, I mean, we've yeah. got like three million posts up there. You know, I prune them every year. I kill a lot of them, but it's it's active. I, I We do seven million people a month or something like that. 
So who right. knows? It's oh, really yeah. a good resource for people that are new that are getting into it, and it's free. You can get on there. I know there's a section, and I'm jumping ahead, Anthony, to another question and the thing, but I know there's a um, section on there that is uh, the training section that you can, the online training section. Yeah. What, what does that entail? Like if somebody wanted to get that, how much is it, and what does that get you? It's it, The online training is 15 bucks a month. So it's less than a box of ammo. And I put up videos. There's 60, 70 plus videos up. And what I do is every month I do like a 10 minute video with a lesson. I can answer questions and talk about your position and different stuff. But what I'll do is I'll go through every month and just put different videos like for recoil management. Cause that was a big thing that came out of rifles only and what we have done down there. I have 45 minutes on just recoil management. Recoil management in the prone, recoil management on a bench, recoil management from a barricade, you know, all those different things. So on just one topic, you know, you got 45 minutes of video to talk about that and, and break it down. And a lot of those videos are broken down into like a lot of minutia. But at the same time, I, I don't drone on. I try to get to the point in my videos as quick as possible. Like I can't stuff like I do 10 minutes for those videos. But like any YouTube video, I try to keep under like six, seven minutes because I just yeah. can't suffer them myself. But, um, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And you can look at the stats of some of these YouTube videos that they'll give you the the, the attention span of that that video you have up there. And you'll be like surprised on what it is. It's like you might put out a 12 minute video and the average attention span is like a minute long. Right. Where people just watch it for a minute and then clicked off. So I don't know how much you know how much you pour into that stat but i've always been a fan of trying to keep the videos as on youtube at least as as, as small as i possibly can on a subject to like keep that attention going yeah totally um, you know like i i really don't like to go over 5 minutes unless it's absolutely necessary to get the the whole point of the video across but i usually like to stay under under that and, it, um, and it's not only like keep the attention um because like if i'm watching something i'll pay attention to it but like if i'm Googling something like, hey, I need to learn how to do this real quick. And of course, YouTube results come up. And it's like, huh, there's a video that's four minutes long on this subject or a video that's three minutes long on the subject. I'm going to watch that three minute video. Ain't nobody yep, yep. time for it. Absolutely. Yep. yep. I, I, and I only do the 10 minutes because people are paying for it. And I figured they paid, they want to see it. But I'm 100% I'm agreement. Like three to five minutes is the sweet spot. If you yeah. can be within that three to five minutes, you'll get a, a heck of a lot more. Uh, you know from it and so if guys who are droning on for a half hour about a subject it's like how do you even suffer that i, yeah. I, I have no clue <laughs> yeah it, it sometimes it's rough you know it, it's rough and i know there's a, a lot of guys that i follow on the youtube side of things the gun reviewers whatever you know competition shooters but you know like i see it all right it's 26 minutes long do i have the time to sit here <laughs> for 26 minutes and listen to even though i might find i find them entertaining and i have no problem listening to 26 minutes worth but do i have that sit down time currently usually i don't and then the video will sneak past my feed and then it's gone unless i go right. back and and search it up um but i mean honestly can, where do ahead. most people watch their videos <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, YouTube. <laughs> no, well, she's trying to stay in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, most, Jennifer's making a bathroom joke. Most mm -hmm. people are watching these when they go to the shitter. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to watch a 30 minute one, their legs will fall asleep. Yeah, they man. want a four minute video. <laughs> you're in the shitter for, for an hour long. For everything. Like, well, let's just <laughs> be honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why I'm always in the shitter for like 45 minutes to an hour. People are like, what are you doing in there? Are you alive? Can you walk <laughs> after you sit on it for that long? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't realize the time sometimes. Man. Just, to me, I'm in there for 10 minutes, but apparently that's not the case. So, um, but yeah, any upcoming matches, projects, or goals you have coming, Frank? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always doing something. We got projects going on, you know, with the classes starting in March at the end of the month. So I'm starting my classes are going and then travel. Probably going to do an ELR thing down at gun site next month and, and stuff. But I don't, I mean, my projects, the APO stuff, it's the website every week. We just did a big updates on, you know, skins and templates and things. And I'm redoing the front page on the site. So we got all that stuff going on. But I mean, there's always something going on. And if I, if I'm home and everything's good and there's a local match, I go up to it. You know, we have the Pawnee up the road um, and, and um, you know, Fort uh, Collins up there. And, 
I'll go shoot that. Uh, you know, I just came back from rifles only and went and shot that match and I'll just blend in to wherever I can and do my usual kind of sniper's hide, you know, everyday sniper podcasty stuff. Yeah, there we go. I mean, I know you probably, this topic has been beat to death, um, but I remember this was before Jen got into the, the PRS thing. She was still doing the pistol, the three gun stuff. And, you know, we're friends on Facebook, but we really haven't had any interaction. So I don't really know you from a can of paint, right? Other than you coming on the show. And then you put, there was an article that was shared all over the fucking place on social media a couple of years ago regarding, I almost forget what it was regarding. I, m I know we talked about it on a couple shows. I think it was regarding sponsor shooters. I think there was some possible cheating going on or entitlement yeah. of some of those. Yeah, it's some the of entitlement. Those thing and and it was about three years ago so what had happened is rifles only had a match and after the top 10 came up now understand their prize table was very similar to my prize tables back because we used to do them together they had over a two hundred thousand dollar prize table for just over a hundred shooters so they did one through ten and when one through ten was done jacob called up the ro's and he said, okay, my ROs go to the prize table. And people flipped out. And they actually wrote a letter afterwards complaining to him, like, who does he think he is giving the prizes to the range officers when the, the shooters deserve them, is the, was what the letter said. And it was anonymous. They used an email scrubber. And so he couldn't reply. He didn't know who did it. And he was mad. So he called me up in the middle of the night and he's like, hey, dude, you got to make this hurt. And it was like, what's going on? I wasn't even there. And people who were there, who knew me and who were PRS owners were there, said, you know, when Frank finds out, it's game on because it's a pet peeve of mine. You are not entitled to a prize. The thing says you will get a trophy if you won. Nothing else. There's nothing that says you're guaranteed a prize. So these people resell the prizes. They were getting it, they buy it, and it pays for their next match. Well, when they didn't get the better prize, they complained. So I made a letter as harsh as I could because I was asked to make it as harsh as I could because they wanted it to have impact. And, you know, so you would ask me, earlier, would I have wrote that letter today? If it was a situation that happened to me, would I have wrote that letter today in the same way? No. I would, I, I, if I want you, I, I, I'd get you with the, with the honey, not the vinegar. I poured vinegar on the situation on purpose, where if I wanted to talk to you and said, hey, guys, we should think about spreading out the wealth. We, you know, our rows don't get paid. It, it, they're taking their time away. They're standing there, and, and there's no match without an RO. You know what I mean? And no real right. match anyway, or otherwise we're self-scoring. So it was, it was about that, and it was really a, it was a culmination of, hey, this needs to be fixed. Yeah, don't worry about it. Well, why not? It's making you look bad. Don't worry about it. It's my buddy. Okay, got it. Hey, this needs to be fixed. Yeah, don't worry about it. Well, what do you mean don't worry about it? People are taking notice. Yeah, but, you know, those guys are really special and don't worry about it. Really? Okay, but you look bad. And so that was the point where you'd say it in the backside a hundred times and you would get dismissed. So finally, it was like, okay, this is getting worse now. The air of entitlement to say that top prize is mine was getting out of control, at least in a lot of the old school guys' mind, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they, they know I'm vocal. They know I'm not afraid to call, you know, call it as I see it. And so they came to me to be the messenger. Unfortunately, it's really easy to shoot the messenger. And yeah, I went, I went over the top. <laughs> I admittedly, and we were all, you know, it was kind of like when in, I don't know if you saw this part of it, when the fallout happened and everybody was completely pissed, I actually did a little one minute video with the camera over my shoulder. And I was drawing on a picture of a burned bridge and me with matches and a, a book of matches. <laughs> and I was throwing and people were on fire falling off the bridge. And then I had the song on from Walking Dead when they put Daryl in that room and they kept playing that Sunshine song. Oh, oh my God. I, I played that in the background while I was drawing a picture of burning a bridge. <laughs> and that was my response to everybody who was mad at Frank. Because yeah. I don't care. What are you going to do, dude? Shave my head and send me to boot camp? 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like it's a game. I don't. So I I made it is sort of uncool or harsh as possible, and yeah, it was polarizing as hell, but it was viral as fuck because of yeah. how I wrote it, and that right. was the goal. Right. So in the grand scheme, you really don't have any problem with sponsor shooters at all, right? No, I mean, I'll sponsor not... shooter if you want to get down to it. That's yeah. why I gave you guys a picture of me in a jersey. I mean, I shoot right. prime and, you know, I, I have a thing with, I don't have a problem with sponsored shooters. I have a problem with unsportsmanlike shooters. Yeah. You know, I have a problem with people who don't recognize this is bigger than one person, one event, one prize off the prize table. If you really need that thing that bad, I'll give it to you. I have it here. I guarantee what you were going to take nah. off the prize table, I got sitting right behind me. I'll give it to you, dude. But, you know, I don't go to, for me, like they don't charge me to shoot a match. I don't go to a prize table. I even argued with Gary in the high heels because I, 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 I placed at that event in the high heels. And Gary called me and said, Frank, you got a trophy. I said, no, I don't. He said, yeah, you got top veteran LE. And at first it said mill. I said, Gary, I'm not in the military anymore. He said, no, it's veteran. You're top veteran shooter. I said, Gary, I don't give a shit. Give it to somebody else. He goes, no, I can't give it to somebody else. You want it. I argued with him in front of the match for five minutes. Like, no, I'm not taking your prize. <laughs> so that's my point. It's like. Well, and I there are a lot of sh uh, sponsored shooters that are uh, at the top of the board, and then they're going and they're giving their prize away. We always did. Uh, they're going like up and they're saying, I want the person that was 95th or I want the person that was 111th, have them come up and they'll call common. up that random person and they'll give it away. I mean, my first match, Tim Milkovich gave me his prize off the table. So we there used are to good do people training still rifles. doing it. Yeah, we used to do training rifles, uh, 22 trainer. If you were last place but shot every stage and didn't get a DQ, we gave you a training rifle. Or That's a certificate awesome. for a class. Because it's like, dude, you came in last place, but you shot everything. Here you go. Practice more. You know, and, and some people would look at it in different, but we always gave prizes away. I've seen, you know, Jacob back in the day used to win everything like a Terry Cross. And I seen him give all those prize rifles away every single time because he knew he wasn't going to shoot it in different and need it. I can call somebody up and say, hey, man, give me a rifle, and they'll give it to me. Why do I got to take it off the table from somebody else? I don't, you know? And so that's the point of – and people don't get it, that sponsors hate that they just gave you a $5,000 prize, and it's for sale on Monday. Mm -hmm. They hate that, and, and they don't get it that, okay, if you're going to sell it on Monday, at least do something social media with it before it gets sold. Because how many pictures do we see of guys who win a $2,800 Night Force? And Night Force only has a picture of Bob with the box. Yeah. And then it's sold. All, all you know, you gave them a pic. Okay, they gave you a $2,800 scope to give away, and you gave them a picture of the box. Mm -hmm. Or n sometimes not even that. Right. And, and it, where's the return on investment? So I'm looking at this from a sponsor side because – on Sniper's Hide, the Everyday Sniper, my own life, I deal with companies every single day. There's not a day that a gun company does not call me up. So I'm looking at it from their standpoint. I'm looking at it from the match director standpoint. I'm looking at it from the match shooter standpoint because I still host my matches every year. I still do them up uh, like Washington's this year in June. You know, it's all these things come into play. And if you want to grow the sport, you can't just – grow the top 10 guys and make them look good it's got to be about the bottom 90 it's got to be about the people financing your sport you know so it's like i always say like i mean i'm sponsored largely in part because i do the show and i always struggle with the like well you know should i be sponsored am i more deserving than the next person or whatever but i really think it comes down to the the new shooter that's coming in or the mid-pack shooter is going to give more return on the investment to a sponsor that's giving something than a top tier shooter. And it's not that a top tier shooter is not great, 
but that new shooter has to go buy gear. They don't have all their gear yet. Right. So mm -hmm. they're out there trying. So the mid pack shooters are talking to the newer shooters more because, you know, they're still new and learning and all that. And so they're like, yeah, I got this product. And I feel like there's a lot of return on investment from mid pack shooters. And, and just out you there know, to, and passionate about it. Yes. Yeah, so to put a kind of a point on it, I, cause I deal with mile high, mile high is right up the road. They sponsor a lot. They do a different thing. They're the accuracy international distributor. So I'm there weekly. They'll get a guy, they'll give a chassis, $1,200 chassis to somebody at a match and somebody will take it off the table knowing they can't use it or won't use it. They'll call up Monday morning and say, will you give me the money if I give this back to you? Oh wow. my God. Seriously? Big time. All the time. They, people do that a lot, which was part of the letter because I'm seeing this in real time. And then the other justification is, well, I got a $2,800 scope from Night Force. They'll sell it to somebody online for $2,400 to make the quick sale because it's free money for them. And then they'll go, but I'm giving a guy a scope he wants for less money. No, you just devalued Night Force's product. So now somebody's going to say, and the, and the story will turn into a game of telephone, and they'll say, Hey, my buddy bought this for $2,400. Will you sell me one for $2,400? Or I'm not going to buy one. I'm going to wait to get one from somebody at a match who's going to sell it cheap because my buddy's a top 10 guy and I can get it from him for 24, not 28. So you're not washing everybody's hand in the circle. You're only washing select people's hands and you're letting the rest spend for themselves. And that's my complaint. And, and that's why I, I get passionate about it. I'm passionate about this. I've been doing it for, you know, since 1986 is when I went to sniper school. Been doing this a long time. And I'm still this passionate about it. I still go out on my own and do all these matches or do training and do competition. I don't, you know, I can go get a different job, but I don't. I'm passionate. I do it because I like it. <laughs> oh, who's that? Exactly. Yeah, you said I, yeah. I was born in 86. Yeah, that's when I went to sniper school, yeah. man. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like, that was not me. Yeah. I'm the old lady yeah. on the show. These yeah, two yeah. are youngins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was I'm like, getting notes and I'm like, oh, man. But no, that's all. I mean, that's all it is. It's passion that comes out into it. it, 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 it you know, I'm, I'm unfiltered, so it offends certain people. But I look at it where if you're offended by what I said, you might be part of the problem. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We have a bunch of... Uh, Live comments over in a, on the YouTube side of things. Okay. Bob Jones says hi. Sniper Kitty says hi. We appreciate those comments coming in. Um, what else we have? I think. Uh, well, Daniel Drake. says the big ones are fun. Talking about matches, the oh. ones are fun, oh. but treat it as a social event. You miss out on a lot if you're just there to shoot. That's it so is definitely truth. a social event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that are, you know, that or talking to people that are like, you know, do you like vacation? I'm like, yeah, you know, I vacationed to Finger, Tennessee and Blakey, Georgia. And it's like, oh, I shoot when I'm there too also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good. I, I went, like I said, the first last week at Rifles Only or a week ago, whatever it was, 10 days ago, I, I went by myself because there's no squads at Rifles Only. You just go to, to the open stage. So you can mm -hmm. walk and go wherever you want. So I went really fast, but I met all new people I had never talked to. Most were listeners or viewers. And it's like, God, I, I had to have met more people ever because I wasn't in a squad than being in a squad and just meeting the five or ten guys that are there that you might not know. Or mm -hmm. like most of us do, is try to squad with only the people we know. You know, and that takes away from that, you know, expanding your base or learning about different people's experiences and, mm -hmm. you know, picking something up or you may see a brand new guy you never met before you meet him and he makes this mistake and a light bulb goes off. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, that guy just made a mistake that totally just tricked the light bulb on me. I can solve that problem for everybody. When I get home, I'm going to video it and fix it because I saw some guy I never met make a mistake that I've never seen made before, you know, and, and it helps, but I don't know. It's there's, there's different schools of thought where, you know, the better guys clump together to watch each other because they don't trust each other anyway, you know, so they want to keep an eye to make sure Bob shot the, the stage, right. You know, and it's like, yeah. well, what fun is that? If, if you're working a job, yeah. you know, yeah, I think so if, great. We, if, if we're ever shooting a match together, you totally got to shoot with me, Frank. I will teach you all sorts of ways to screw some stuff Awesome, up. dude. We're on it. We're there, man. Because <laughs> I just like having fun, man. I don't care. You know what I mean? Yeah. Greg, you have a date with Tactical Muffin Top. 
to take him shooting. Do I? I do. Uh, is that Dewey? He that's, said he that's was, Dewey. He said that yeah. you better take him shooting. I see how it is, Dewey. You don't want me to take you shooting. You just want Greg. I, I see how it is. I'll see you tomorrow night. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Dewey, are you shooting tomorrow night? Um, I'm just yeah. saying I yeah. smell better than he does. That's all I'm I, saying. I don't know. I, I, oh, I told you now we got a throwdown today. going on, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, William Dawson says, keep fighting the good fight, Frank. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, there, there's some guys out there that get it. I mean, believe me, for, for every negative comment, there's definitely guys on the backside that throw positives out. And and at some point, depending on the topic, there's two to one when people – because we, we need to bring more people into the sport. So, like I said, you got to focus on that back 90 and not the top 10. So, um, and, you know, that's that's just what it comes down to is that I, I look at the big picture – more than than the, the 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 main guys. Like I said, the, the main guys aren't a draw. Nobody's showing up to an event because they they get to see somebody win, who's been winning the last three events. You know, most people are showing up because they, they want to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gina Gina Milkovich says, if any of you ever have a chance to be around Frank in person, buy him a drink and then just shut up and listen. You'll learn <laughs> more than you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, so, hey, I, I, it's an energizer bunny thing guys i never shut up <laughs> so hey I, I got a question and this, this one is to everyone including myself just off of what we were just talking about what's everybody's worst match blunder like what's that one thing that always you're like that was just like the most random stupid thing that just screwed me so hard I had my bipod fall off a couple times last week. It was pretty funny. I started laughing. It was it was shaking loose and falling off. So I was on a stage and I'd start shooting. And the next thing I know, my bipod. The worst was the air dingo, the helicopter. I was pulled into the um into the rope, and I'm nailing it, man. I'm I'm hitting them all. I'm like shot seven clean, shot eight. My bipod goes flying out the um, the door in front of the firing line and down the other way. And I had the next state after shot 10, I was supposed to go to prone and now shoot it prone without oh, my shit. bipod and everything out the door of the helicopter. So that was, Damn. That was funny. And it Jen, happened more than once. Jen, what about you? Oh God. Why you gotta ask these questions? Cause it's so, a great question. My very first major three gun match, I was super nervous, had never shot any long range and I, long range. I mean, three gun long range, which is like 300 yards. Hadn't even ever done that. And I go up to Woody's and I was all excited to shoot this match. And the day before we went and scoped out the stages and wrote notes and the very first stage, the first thing was shooting the long range, the 300 yards out the back of a van. And I was having a little difficulties because I didn't had never had anybody teach me and didn't know what I was doing. And so I finally went to dump the rifle and it was empty. And so in my head, I was like, okay, just put it down. So I just put it down and got out of the van, but you were supposed to dump it in the dump barrel that was outside of the van. Mm. And so I got DQ'd. So I spent money on a major match in a hotel and got to paste and reset targets all weekend. Ow. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good, a good uh, humility lesson, but I had fun. I had a great time pasting and hanging with everybody, but I was not happy with myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've been there. I think I've had, I've learned everything the hard way. I've yeah. had mags fall Me out, too. mags fall out of pouches running. I've had guns fall on the, the ground. I've had guns fall on the ground at the very first stage where I traveled to a major match and I never shot a round. It was I, probably one of the quickest DQs probably people have seen, you know, <laughs> and, and you, I mean, you couldn't, I was on fire, you know, I was on super squad. I was with fucking people from like Smith and Wesson head haunt, you know, you know, people that, you know, this was like, if shooting USA was there, they were filming that squad and they would have caught that on camera. Like I, I, I turned around and looked at people and people's jaw were on the floor. They were like, dude, did you really just fucking do that? Oh Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was pretty bad, but I became a tourist. I helped, I helped kind of, uh, obviously pace. And, but then the next day, cause it was a two day match. I just went and became a tourist and did everything by myself. It was like taking selfies fucking off a bridge or something. I was like, yeah, but <laughs> I was just, you know, I was trying to make the best of it at that point. It wasn't like it was a local match. You know, it was, I was, I was, I, I couldn't drive back. I couldn't really fly back. It was just like, just make whatever, whatever you have, just make it fun. 
Yeah, I was out of town on mine. It was it was not very forgiving. Yeah. yeah. So Ryan Hay answered our question also, and he said he uh, he accidentally skipped a position on a stage. Um, he said it was a very cleanable stage, not only a cleanable but very cleanable stage. Um, but for me, like I I DQ'd for my first first time in four years in January, um, and later found out that was a gun malfunction that caused me to. Um, possibly nd when the slide went forward um but mine was probably when i learned it's a bad idea to have leftover uspsa pasters in my pocket that i put my bolt gun bag in i thought i was gonna clean my first stage and all of prs at the gap grind and i go and i put the bolt forward and it just stopped i'm sitting there coaching him and i'm like i have no clue what you've done he had Mm. pasters stuck in his bolt gun nice oh like yeah. I said, Frank, I'll teach you a lesson on screwing some stuff up. <laughs> and and yeah. it's funny, man. As long as you can laugh and learn from it. I mean, that's the thing. It, you know, you, you take the matchbooks they have and you say, hey, I could do better here. And you keep notes for yourself and, and just kind of take it from there. Because we all – but I just crack up and start laughing, man. I don't care. I, I just think it's funny and just start talking and, you know, start talk, conversing with the ROs and who's ever around. Did you guys just see that? How crazy is that? Well, well, what am I going to do now? You know? and, and all I could do is laugh about it after. You know, It was immediately after yeah. I was laughing, and I'm still laughing about it now. But I, I was so excited because it was it was a far to near stage, and it was impact, 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 impact. And I want to say it was like shot 7 of 10 or something. And all of a sudden, the gun quit freaking working. Yeah. But yeah, so I got my, my Kydex guy. He's, he's got me a really nice little thing to put the magazine in now. <laughs> yeah there you go yeah you learn you definitely learn I, i'm usually on fire like i'm i mean i'm not kicking dirt on the ro's feet or anything like that but i'm just upset at myself like it takes me a few stages just to you know shit happens and then we'll laugh about it but at the moment i was like dude i can't like i flew all the way out here i brought all this ammo i prepare i had the stage in my head i was golden we're shooting with the vogels we're shooting with everybody everybody's looking at me right the big cameras whatever the lights and i blew it and i was just i was on fire but you know calm down and we had some drinks and then i tell that story to almost a lot of people i know a lot of people locally have heard it and they're like dude you really even you tell that shit i'm like yeah dude i don't at this point i don't care it's done and it's that's when you go find a strip club yeah. that's part yeah. of what's wrong with the shooting community is nobody ever posts their bumbles on facebook everybody posts the perfect things i post some of my bumbles on there i'm like look what i did <laughs> i'm a dummy yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bumble every time i shoot yeah i, I, I got a live one real quick Go ahead. um derek wants to know i don't remember if we answered this earlier um of what's the wait time on the rifles and he also wants to yeah. know what's like the average cost of your class and what should you have before you attend one of your classes um the, the, mine's a basic class so the the average colorado class is a thousand bucks i have a two-day one that's 750 my alaska classes are actually half of that but they're two-day they're shorter classes um they're 550 but those sell out crazy um quick but what you need is you really need your rifle and a good scope you know and that kind of set up your bipod and things like that a rear bag and then a good attitude, man. You don't need much beyond that, a data book or something to write on, a notebook. Uh, we we get you to where you need to be, um, you know, because I am I do fundamentals in a basic class. I'm giving you the foundation, and then from there we can build on where you want to go. But, um, you know, uh, my three-day class is 1000 bucks. My two-day class is anywhere from 550 to 750 depending where it is. On, and, and the rifle time is uh, about four to six weeks lead time, depending where you fall in on the queue. Uh, like I said, they got over 200 inquiries about buying the rifle, and they're building them as we speak. And so um, it's just what order you get into the queue for those rifles until they get until they get through the initial rush, because there's always going to be a basic rush right now. And we're looking at four to six weeks, and then after that rush is over. I, I would guarantee turnaround is going to be much faster. They'll have it ready to go. It's it's really the engraving on the chassis and the coating right now because um, they've engraved all the chassis with uh, my logos and stuff. So that's what we're looking at. That's yeah. coating, not a, not a, uh, not an anodizing, right? No, coating, right. right. <laughs> we're coating them. Yeah, there we go. I got one more here, and I think we can wrap up some live, and then we'll kind of close this one out. Um, Frank, your thoughts on production division because it seemed to be – um, 
you know, it was it was asked. It seemed like it was highly people wanted to see it. And then when it came out, it was it was hyped. And then I, I it seems to be like one of the least shot divisions now. Where yeah. where 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 are we at with this? I mean, I, 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 I like thought it. the Ruger would help it out. I thought things like that, but it doesn't it doesn't seem to have. I think they hobbled themselves on, like I said, there's a lot of different, we, if we wanted to go down the rules and nitpick, I really could, but I, I don't want to do that with them. Uh, you know, let them, let them change it. But I think they kind of messed with themselves with the scope limit and the, the rifle limit. It's one thing to say, okay, we'll take a $2,000 rifle, but let them put any scope on it. They want, you know, cause your scope can travel to up, upgrade with you. So I think they put too much limitations on beyond just saying, a production rifle and i don't think it ever took off i would probably if it was up to me i would want to reinvent that division i'll say my first year shooting i was shooting a um mpa light the va light which mm -hmm. is a production rifle but my scope bumped me so i couldn't do production yeah so i would i would i would adjust that but again it's not my not my division i'm not a member man you know i shoot the matches and i'll tell people go shoot them don't you don't have to be a member to shoot a match because the matches are individually you know but at the same time i don't want to undercut their message this year as far as letting them get off the ground with a new ownership so but in my opinion production was never fully thought out well i think they have like a good opening idea and then they don't execute completely mm -hmm. right it, you know and so i would re replay that execution and change the rules up to make production a lot more viable for people and then they they definitely like i know the guy who won production not maybe not last year the year before he just um I'm, he might have been at the expo they let they, they he had to beg him to get their, his picture taken you know and, and oh. he was upset he's like dude i won production class and nobody even asked me my name you know and so Damn. they kind of dropped the ball on that a bit and, and I know he was upset with how they handled his production class win. But I think it's a good idea. Just, you know, the execution needs to be adjusted. Yeah, I'm uh, getting into it, of course. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm half Jewish. My, my mom's Jewish. So it's like I'm always trying to, like, do, do stuff for as cheap as I can. And I started looking into production. And I was like, man. And I started looking at, like, match scores and stuff. I'm like, there, there's nobody. How are you half shoots? a religion? Do you only go, like, every other time <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so I got the good with money part and nothing about the religion part. I, okay. I don't even know the name of all the holidays. I just wonder, like, maybe, like, you go every other month or you only go, like, <laughs> odd Sundays or for you would be Friday, right? Friday, that. I, just, I, I, I don't even know, to be honest, Frank. Yeah, me neither. Uh, I have I'm no clue. Jewish, but I just didn't know if you only went to, like, odd number days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I love you, it. You, Somebody's you, giving him a hard time. You said you set yourself up for that. Mm. I, I did, man. I did. It was just, you know, take it. Here we, uh, all right, I think we can wrap this one up unless we have any live on your, your end, guys. Anything? Uh, I should probably right. check that. Let me check. Refresh. Check it real quick. Loading, loading, loading. Come on, Comcast. Yeah, I think we're good. I think there's there's some comp. Yeah, Doug Koenig, Shot Production. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was. Oh, yeah, man, they're, they're all going to. Uh, Latham shot last week um, in Arizona. Uh, I saw. Uh, Todd Jarrett came to the uh, thing. He was looking at the AIs when we were doing the range day. Jarrett's going to shoot PRS. They're, all these guys are coming into the PRS side now. Oh, I don't want to go head-to-head -head with Todd Jarrett again. I was about to say, how did that go again? Uh, there was okay. a shotgun match, and I had to go head-to-head -head in a shoot-off against Todd Jarrett. He apologized to me before we even shot. <laughs> out it. Yeah, that, that's a rough name to draw. Yeah, he, he 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 shot it and like made a sandwich before. <laughs> you didn't have to go there. I thought you were my friend. I, I, I am. That's if, why like, I talk shit. Not to be crass or anything, but I, if I was you and I had to do a shoot off against Todd Jarrett, I'd pull my shirt off. <laughs> I would have just stood there with my shirt off and been like, "Dude, okay, we're gonna shoot it." If I was like you, like if we switched places, did like a Freaky Friday thing, and I'd be like, "All right, dude, shoot now." <laughs> Stand mm -hmm. right in front of him, right? Yes, I would totally I, distract him. I like Frank. He has good ideas. Yeah. Speedo, <laughs> speedo in a wig. There we go. <laughs> all right, guys. I think we're good to wrap this one up. On my end, there's a thank you guys for all the comments and for tuning in tonight. But we're going to go into shout outs. Jen, you usually start us off. What do you have? Yep. 
Shout out to Macmillan Stocks. Mine is still being stalked by Regina. I hope. Keep stalking, Gina. I want more pictures. Um, Night Force Optics, Warren Scope Mounts, uh, Lansing Tactical for your gas gun needs, Under Industries for jerseys, Prime Ammunition, Shooters of Augusta, and Sharpshooters of Augusta. Check them out if you are here local to us. They're awesome. Oh, Greg, what do you got? I have Shooters and Sharpshooters of Augusta. I have Overwatch Defense for an awesome Cerakote job, PDC Custom for a super awesome rifle chassis, um, and NDZ Performance to definitely build your Gucci Glock. So, uh, Frank, any shout outs? What do you got, man? Uh, just at the APO, thanks a lot for doing that rifle to Dr. Harold Fuzzenstein, my dog. Um, <laughs> he's always there on the podcast. And then Mike from the Everyday Sniper, and thanks everybody for listening on that. And then the Sniper Side crew. Thank you guys, and just hide everybody out there in you know podcast land and e blog land. <laughs> well, there we go. Shout out to my end. If you're watching on the YouTube side of things, yellow button right below the video is the subscribe button. Every Tuesday, we're doing a new episode of the Shooter's Mindset featuring another great guest, and that's your way to kind of be informed about it. Uh, folks over at Tactical Shit for always supporting us over the years. Folks over at Tandem Cross for all your rim fire needs if you're kind of trying to build a 1022 race gun or you're just trying to find parts for an old uh, rimfire gun check them out if you want to email me the shooters mindset at gmail.com is a good way to do that uh definitely thanks to frank here for spending two hours of his time here with us for episode 255 um and that'll do it thank you guys for tuning in tonight we'll see you on the next one